Hi everyone. Today we'll be talking about Tati Dupont's story about Andre, 70 Fierce Years. Andre is a Cossack from the early 20th century, and today we'll be taking a closer look at his wife, Dasha, who plays an important role in his life. So first of all, Tete, how did Andre get to know Dasha? How long have they known each other? That's an excellent question. Well, I think Andre and Dasha have had the very good fortune of knowing each other since, I would say, childhood, since they were 13 years old. Uh, how they met was kind of interesting. So uh, many times in rural Dong Cossack communities, there was often like a rotation of lands exchange, so to speak. So their old neighbors, uh, the Evanoffs, have moved somewhere else. And that's just because of the rotation of lands, property rights, things of that nature. And a new family's moving in. And of course, it's another Don Cossack family, because in the Stanitsa, it's, it's, you know, everyone there's pretty much a, you know, Don Cossack family. And uh, this is a family uh, from about some miles or so away. Not too far, but just, you know, far enough that you don't really know them. Uh, the Tatarasevs. And uh, the Tarasevs consist of, you know, young Dasha, who was 13 at the time, the same as Andre, her mother Irina, and her father, whom I will describe in very unflattering terms in, as, we, as these discussion progresses, Lukian. So uh, essentially, um, like I said, Andre and Dasha had the good fortune of knowing each other since childhood. So Andre was curious about Dasha mainly due to the fact that he had heard from his family members about a supposed dispute between his father, Danilo, and Dasha's father, Lukian, uh, in the past. So Andre's curious about this family, and not really so much on Lukian, because Lukian would even scare Satan. And, you know, Irina just seems like kind of too meek and like just too shy, but Dasha really piques Andre's interest. She's around his same age. And even though Andre knows some girls, you know, from the study to his own age and things like that, and, you know, a variety of girls, you know, just kids in general, um, he's kind of curious about her attitude and how she presents herself. You know, she's very mature. She's, um, she's sort of like, like, like premature, so to speak, because she is so mature beyond her years. She seems very jaded, cynical, kind of cold and hardened. She doesn't really seem to be her age. And Andre later learns out it's because she has a very challenging life uh, with her father and her father's family. So it's really, really, you know, basically fueled her to become, um, <coughs> pardon me, very hardened, uh, very mature, very cynical. And Andre's attracted to Dasha, not so much in a romantic way, they're only 13 years old, but, you know, he's intrigued by her, you know, because of her, you know, very cool, aloof nature and that, you know, he, she kind of reminds him of a very, you know, observant cat, you know, watching from a distance, you know. And um, so that is how Andre met Dasha. And uh, Dasha is not sure what to make of Andre. He seems to be like a very boisterous young fellow. Um, she actually gets to know his brother, his little brother at first, Kolya, because Kolya is, you know, a bit more cool and collected um, and a bit of a silent deadpan snarker. So she gets to know the little brother a little bit better before she gets to know Andre. But uh, they do form um, an unlikely friendship. And that in itself um, kind of sets the foundation for their relationship and thus having a good foundation you know, they're able to build a very strong relationship that, you know, survived over the years and survived over different events like, um, you know, the Civil War, the Dawn Counter Revolution, the after effects of that, decossification, um, then just going through all the turmoils of the Soviet um, Union building up and the way people were living a new life and stuff in the cities and stuff. And then, um, you know, even as they, you know, get older, like through like the depression and then, you know, like World War II and things like that until finally, you know, they both kind of pass away in the, you know, late 50s, early 60s. I see. 
I see. That's a really broad scope. And I think, you know, we will be exploring so much about how these two people change in the course of their life as the environment around them changes and they themselves change. I think it will be a very touching story. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, it's certainly it's certainly wonderful to write about these two. I'm very thankful that Andre has been very open about, you know, his relationship with his wife and how it's been a very um, integral part of him, you know, as he's made, he's, he's emphasized very clearly to me, um, because I think without Dasha, he would not be where he is and be who he is, I think, without her, which which doesn't really say that he doesn't have character or that he's, you know, really codependent on her in, in the technical sense. But, you know, the fact that, you know, I think sometimes some people need to be urged by someone or they need, you know, they need to have something or someone give them purpose. I mean, which, you know, you know, I think it should be, you know, clarify, you know, he's not putting her on a pedestal or, you know, keeping all these expectations. He doesn't, he doesn't, but you know, it's the fact that she's trying her best and that prompts him to do his best. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I really enjoyed discovering more and more about their relationship and I'm glad Andre's opened up about it, you know, with, as I write it. As I understand, you've been writing a lot about Andre in the last couple of weeks and before you hadn't written that much about Dasha, right? No, no, I hadn't. I only had written a few excerpts, um, I would say maybe three years ago, I would say, uh, maybe, oh, no, earlier than that, I think it was like perhaps four years ago, I was doing some like commissions and things and I was writing about Andre's past love life and like she was the last person, you know, because there was a, there was an alternate universe for, for a role play that you and I were doing um, with Andre and one of your characters, Katya, in another universe. I remember, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So how do you think it is like to go back to a character that you haven't touched in such a long time and flesh her out? Uh, you know, she's actually been on my mind a long time with Andre. I, I fleshed her out quite a bit, but I didn't really write about her because I wasn't sure what format to present her in. Um, but revisiting her again, I'm able to make changes to her. Well, not changes, but I get to know her better. You know, for example, I had originally thought of Andre being like stoic and gruff and stern, but he's not really. I mean, yes, he's got a short temper. And, you know, I mean, when he glares, I mean, you know, it looks like his face is made out of granite, but um, it's, it, uh, Andre is actually kind of a fiery, cheerful, peppy fellow. I mean, he's, you know, going, um, you know, he's, he's a bit innocent and naive in some respects. Um, while Dasha, I think, serves as the cold foil, you know, she is the ice foil, she's the serious one, um, you know, she's just, you know, dead serious woman, you know, and I, I think that's a good foil for Andre, he needs that, you know, he needs that kind of steadiness and, and constants, you know, in his life, and she provides that, and, and she gladly provides it, and, and, you know, she does struggle with opening up with her emotions and showing warmth, as, there's always a psychological hindrance in the back of her head, you know, because of her childhood and everything. But, you know, um, she knows that Andre needs it. And she's, she's glad that she's found a good outlet to be positive with those qualities rather than a bad, bad way to do it, you know. Um, but yeah, coming back to Dasha, I, I really found out a lot more about her. I think she's become more human. Uh, more flawed, more fleshed out. Um, she slowly became one of my favorite female characters, I'd say right after, you know, Gerda and a few others. Um, I, I, and I was thinking about her on her own, you know, thinking about, you know, what was it like being separated from Andre, you know, for those couple years and how she's wanting to kind of um, adapt her life. You know, she doesn't want to you know, she knows they'll never go back to the countryside. They'll never go back to like doing like horse farming and growing wheat and stuff. So they just got to get used to living in the city. And she wants to get into all this technology and educate herself and, you know, kind of, I mean, be part of like some of the positive things that came out of the, the, the growth of the union, so to speak.
I see, I see. That's a really great explanation. And, you know, that really explains how Dasha has grown as a character since you last written about her, you know, four years ago. Yeah, it certainly has. I, I think she, when I guess when we first saw her in Brief Glances, you know, she, she was still kind of, you know, cold, but I think she's a lot more sassy back then, but now she's less sassy, which is what Andre needs because Andre is kind of sassy and he kind of needs Dasha to, you know, keep a, you know, keep him in check. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't let Andre by himself, you know. What is the most difficult part that you encountered when developing Dasha's character? Uh, I think the most difficult part is trying to figure out little tidbits of her personality and things like that. And also, you know, how, you know, would she ever consider another dude besides Andre or, you know, would she ever just consider just single life, you know, or, or what, you know, and also, like I said, little tidbits of her personality, um, cause it is sometimes kind of hard to work with reserved cold people. You really have to dig deep into them. You know, as I've kind of learned with Kai, I think working with Kai kind of helped me prepare for Dasha. I, I think Dasha and Kai probably might have a lot in common you know, a little bit, you know. Um, so you think they get along? I think they'd get along, but it would be like friends who kind of commiserate over their fiery partners, you know, like Kai's like, oh, I don't know, Gerda's like so loud and cheerful and all this, and Dasha would be like, oh, I know, Andre's like loud, and you know, he wants to get into fist fights every time he enters a damn bar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so they they kind of be like friends, like, you know, you kind of see each other and then, I don't know, you fist bump, you know, <laughs> like you understand each other. But no, I don't, but I don't think nothing romantic at all, because I think on, um, I think Kai and Dasha need opposites, just like Gerda and Andre do. So what do you think is the easiest part about writing about Dasha? Easiest part? I think it's when she's interacting with Andre, because she tends to come out of her shell more with Andre. And one might ask, well, didn't she have other friends, you know, in the Stanitsa? And I'm like, yes, yeah, she did. But it's like, she was very cautious of them. And she felt none of them knew her as well as Andre. And then of course, she's got to deal with kind of the stigma of her, you know, jackass dad, you know. And I think a lot of people want to judge her based on her, you know, father and grandfather, which is really wrong. So Andre knows the real her, and she opens up the most with Andre, and her friends, uh, they're there, you know, and, and, you know, maybe she connected with, you know, a few people, but I think it's Andre and his family that, you know, know her the best, and she knows them the best, so that's the kind of easiest thing is doing her interactions, because I think doing her interactions helps you learn more about her character as she opens up, and she kind of breaks out of the the, if you will, the, the nuclear core of ice that she's built around herself. Mm hmm That makes sense. Yeah. Do you think creating her in The Sims has also helped you brainstorm <laughs> more about her? It helped. I mean, at least I know in The Sims alternate universe, they bonded over a piece of clay. <laughs> By the way, for the viewers, the picture behind me is what Dasha looks like in The Sims because Tate and I haven't had a chance to draw her yet, so we decided to create her in The Sims yesterday, and that has really helped Tate to, you know, think about what what she can look like as a drawing. Exactly, it has. It has. You did a beautiful job creating her. I love her eyes, her nose, her lips. Um, you even have the little scar on her face, her hair. I mean, this is just like gosh in real life. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and I, I love it. I truly do. Um, and, you know, it, it helps me because, I mean, I, I can kind of have a feeling of what she looks like, but for me to try to think of it in concrete forms is a little bit hard because I don't have a real life person to base it on, at least not that much of a reference. I mean, I was thinking of, I don't even know who this actress was, but she was like in the first episode of that um, that Russian series about Mayakovsky and there was like this girl 
and I don't know I just saw I thought she had like these really pretty green eyes and I'm like you know and dark hair and I'm like okay could use that as a face clean for Dasha but then I can't find her name and then I can't find many pictures of that because I happen to go into something niche which is Russian serial dramas on TV <laughs> oh my gosh speaking That's the of that thing. Mm -hmm. speaking yeah. of that I think that because I've been reading through a draft novel and I was really impressed on how solid of a grasp you have of the society you know you honestly make it seem like that you're from that society especially with all the different diminutives that different people use for different situations which I always thought was kind of confusing when reading Dostoevsky as a non-Russian. I was like, oh, so when do you use this word? When do you use that diminutive? But I think you got it down really well from what I, I know anyways, but I'm not Russian, so <laughs> yeah. I can't really say. We, we need to invite, we need to invite um, people, like people in Russia, like, you know, people from the Russian Federation, we need to invite them to this podcast and then they can, they can come in and tell me where I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. I mean, you know, once you read like the novels and stuff like that, and of course, you know, I, I tend to use it like, kind of like Sholokhov as my Bible, because I tend to avoid things like Dostoevsky or even Tolstoy, because they're further up north. So it's a mm -hmm. different slice of culture. It's a different ethnicity too. So I try to use Sholokhov as kind of a Bible, because it's a very different flavor. So, Southern Russia because of its like Ukrainian influences and things like that, it's a different world. And I think, um, I think the diminutives are used more liberally in different situations and there are harsher diminutives, uh, maybe not to them. They probably sound softer to them, but to the Northerner, they might sound vulgar, like, oh, Palenska, like, oh, why do you, why would you want to call somebody Palenska? Like, why don't you call her Pelusia or something? But, you know, that would be more like, but I really like her. I'm going to call her Polenska or something. Or you're going to tease, you know, everyone's teasing all the time. So, um, you know, yeah. And, and of course, different situations. Like I, I made, when I was writing tonight, when the Ottoman calls his dad, Danya, he's, he's doing it aside in confidence. Like, I'm telling you this as a friend. Because they were like friends in their youth in their in the uh, military academy as cadet, like a, as a cadet academy, and so he's not using his full name, you know, Danilo, you know, Nikolovich, Nikonovich, and um, I think that's how you pronounce Nikon. Is it Nikon or Nikon? I have no idea. Nikon, I think. I think yeah, it's probably Nikon. I. It's, uh, yeah, so another thing about like Southern Russian names, they use a lot of Greek based names and sometimes the spelling will be different because the way the letters kind of translate because of the Ukrainian influence is different to like what might be an F could be turned into a G or, you know, so on and so on, um, mm -hmm. which makes for an interesting accent. Um, but yeah, it's fun using the diminutives. Um, I think Andre just always calls Dasha Dasha all the time because I think he likes it. It gives her like dignity. It sounds cool and kind of a catch all thing, you know. Um, but I mean, sometimes he'll come up with something cute, like, you know, da, da Chenka or something, or, you know, you know, da, you know, like da Ruzia or something, you know. I think da Ruzia is when he's very desperate and he thinks, oh shit, I'm going to end up in the doghouse tonight. Oh, oh, da Ruzia. And she's not having none of it. And she's probably going to put the pillow on the sofa and like nothing denied, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> so does, um, uh, what's her name? Dasha have a special diminutive for Andre? I've been debating that because Andre's a difficult name to work with for diminutives. I mean, already you don't see it too much. I mean, I've seen some like I said, editions of War and Peace, because, you know, there's a character named Andre, which everyone knows, especially if any anybody who's fans of the great comment out there, you know that line, Andre isn't here. <laughs> um, so, like, you read Tolstoy, and, like, his sister and his dad use some diminutives, like Andreka or Andrusia or something. Um, I don't know if Dasha really does. I think she does to some degree, but I think she's, like, in a very, she'd have to be in a very soft whimsy to do it I think most of the time like if they're outside and stuff should this call him Andre I'm um, just out of dignity because 
you know, I think she likes to give him a lot of dignity. I mean, especially after the whole Civil War thing fell apart, you know, she just likes to give him dignity. And, um, you know, she likes to build him up a little bit because, you know, God knows he needs it. I mean, he's a broken man, you know. Um, then I think at home, if they're being playful or something, or if she's like pissed off, um, you know, she might call him, you know, like, like Andrzejka or, you know, Andrusia or something. I think Andrzej is more of a playful thing. I think Andrzejka, I, I think she seldom uses it. And I, I think it's just because in her mind, even though Andre is fun and warm and outgoing, um, you know, he is a sort of guy, you do have to take him seriously because he 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 is a he has a man of depth and gravity, you know. Don't let his don't let his warmth and bullheaded ways let you think he's not, but he's he's not. So I think she's one of the very few people that truly recognizes his gravity. So I think that's why she's very sparing with the diminutives. And and that's the way he is with her too. So they're pretty much sparing with the diminutives. And I, I think that says a lot. And also there's kind of an art form to using diminutives, what I've learned. Um any Russians who have stepped upon this interview, please correct me if I'm wrong or correct any of us if we're wrong. But diminutives have to be used in certain contexts, in certain situations, and how, when and how you use it determines a lot what you're trying to um, subvertly try to communicate to that person. You know, like if you're teasing them, if you're being playful, if you're not taking them seriously, or if you're trying to be mean and spiteful, and like use something that's childish, like, you know, you know, you know, I don't think you're mature. I'm going to call you a childish name or something, you know. Um, I think that's, I think that's how you kind of use diminutive. And then there's, of course, the soft, gentler ones that you might use, I don't know, in um, situations that require sweet nothings in your ear, you know. Oh, um, but yeah, I see. Yeah, so yeah, art form of uh, diminutive. I mean, at least that's what I take away from studying lit and like, you know, sites that try to tell me about cultural norms abroad, you know. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about Dasha? What is she like the best about Andre and what is her profession? What is her profession? So um, I guess to start off with, um, with, uh, let me see here, uh, give me a second. Um, <clears throat> I think what she likes the best about Andre is his warmth. I think she loves his warmth. He loves, she loves his outgoingness. Ironically, she loves his loudness. Um, his loudness to her symbolizes honesty, being direct and, and candid. You know, she easily knows what he's trying to communicate and she loves him for that because she had grown up in a very frightening household where her father was a very quiet, deadpan guy. I mean, her father, I don't know, he could have been like, if he was in modern days, he'd be like, I don't know, some mafia assassin, like so fucking, um, pardon me, so uh, dead inside. <laughs> Hopefully you bleep out that word. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what made me do that. <laughs> this is the first time I've cursed on a, on a podcast. I apologize to anybody who was listening to that. I hope there were no young children listening to this. <laughs> um. Uh, but I was just doing that because I, you know, I'm just emphasizing how bad her dad is, bad dad. Um, so, you know, she she loves that. And, you know, ironically, Andre kind of worries, like, oh, I should try to be more quiet and not yell or something or or not yell at her. And she just doesn't really mind if he if he yells at her. I mean, as long as you're not saying anything very, very uh, verbally abusive, which Andre tries really hard never to do it. And he's never prompted to anyway, because Dasha doesn't do anything to really upset him. The only, the only thing that would really upset him is situations and his inability or inadequacy to re rectify a situation or fulfill something, you know, that's the only thing he gets mad about. There's nothing, I mean, Dasha could run a pickup truck through the window and he wouldn't be mad about it, you know, but, um, but she, she, she appreciates that. Um, because she was so used to her father being very silent and not knowing what would set him off. You know, when I mean set off, what would make him have a very quiet, silent, violent reaction? And I think it was all that silent and violence that really terrified her. 
And, and I mean, the scariest thing about her father was that he never showed any emotions when he did things. He was almost like a, I don't know, a, a catatonic psychopath, you know? And so she really appreciates Andre's emotional candor, um, his, you know, just vigor about himself, um, his honesty, his loudness. Um, I think she just loves his sincerity. You know, I mean, she's seen a lot of men like, for example, Mirka, who's kind of two-faced. And even though Mirka does have some redeeming qualities, um, he's pretty much suave, persuasive, two-faced, and she hates that. Um, but for her profession, moving on to that. Um, so after after the Civil War, um, she has decided to pretty much go into the city, not tell anybody her ethnicity or anything like that, try to think of a new name and things like that, try to mimic the city accent as best she can. And um, through a couple people she meets, um, particularly like, you know, these really like tough women who are like really, like really on to the revolution. Like, yeah, we women gotta do stuff. Um, she learns to become a telephone switchboard operator and she becomes very proficient at that. You know, she's very quick, very, um, cause this was, a, this was a very hard job to do cause you're like all these things, you know, it's not like today where I press a button and suddenly we're zooming. Um, you know, you have to connect whatever, whatever, to whatever, whatever, you know, it's like operating an airplane to a degree. And she learns how to do that very efficiently. She's probably one of the most capable operators out there. And, um, you know, she's, she's done very well at her job and it's, you know, provided security for herself. And then it later provides, um, you know, a sort of a fallback for she and Andre and their family. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that was a really good summary of what she does in the story and, you know, how she's an independent woman as well, you know, you know right, she's someone right, who can exactly. provide for herself and she has, you know, a goal for herself. And also the part about contrasting Andre with her father was a really good one. So we are exploring, you know, some very, um, you know, psychological themes in your story and some rather controversial ones, such as domestic violence. Right, right. That's sort of the, that's the, that's the big thing. Um, I think that's one thing we've got to applaud, regardless of location or time period. That was like a lot of Russian lit. I mean, if you just exclude Tolstoy, because like Tolstoy's like way too, he whitewashes things too much. Um, but like Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and other writers, and then, you know, like I said, Sholokhov, he's kind of like, you know, go to Bible for learning things about Cossacks. Um, they don't flinch from domestic violence and domestic abuse. It's not like it's glossed over, like a lot of times in like previous Western lit. And it's like made like, oh, thunderstorm and dramatics and stuff like that. It's shown in a very mundane reality, which makes it all the more scarier because, you know, oh, it just happens, you know, people get married and beat the holy hell out of each other. And that it's not supposed to be that way. Um, but, but you know, Russian lit is very honest about that. You know, it's not like in Western where, you know, oh, you know, the, the, the author acts on a high horse and glosses over it. And then, you know, try to say, oh, you know, whatever, they're trying to make a statement about it. Um, particularly like Sholokhov, I mean, he just said, oh boy it's pretty traumatic, well, not traumatic, but like you're on a, it, it's a really, um, it's literally a brick to your face, how he describes a lot of the domestic violence and things like that. In fact, that's kind of what prompts all the things into place is domestic violence. Like um, there is, um, uh, you know, Akasenia, I probably butchered her name, I apologize. You know, her husband, St Stepan, he basically uses her like a punching bag, which, you know, prompts her to have an affair with Gregor, you know? And um, they don't flinch away from the detail. And, and, you know, and we deal with that, you know? I mean, I didn't want people to think, oh, you're just writing about like, like cute whitewashed sugar-coated things about the Cossack community. And I'm like, well, every community is pretty much the same, regardless of ethnicity or whatever ties, political, religion, every society is the same. 
no matter what people try to tell you. It may be different with different things, but everything is the same. Everybody's married, everybody has children, everybody has families, everybody may not want to have children or may not have families or whatever. Humanity still remains the same. Um, and it is a very ugly, nasty thing. But at the same time, I didn't want to be like Sherlock Holmes and just focus on that all the time and all the time, violence, violence, violence. But I think Sherlock Holmes was kind of doing it maybe out of resentment because, you know, with his mother and stuff, there was like conflict with that. Because I think if you read his bio, his dad was like a Cossack and didn't want to give him legitimacy to get land or something. And he's like pissed with that. And then, of course, you know, you're trying to write for the Reds and you're like, oh, these people were so backward. Look how nicer it is now that, you know, everything got into the, you know, union and stuff. So he's got, he's got two motives for going into extremity. So I wanted to make more of a leveled thing. I wanted to show some positive things, some funny things, you know, some happy things. But then at the same time, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to wash it. I'm going to deal with something very sad, very scary, very controversial. And that is domestic abuse, which is unfortunately what Dasha and her mother, Irina, suffer with, with her father, Lukian. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the, co like the comparative contrast between the home life that Dasha grew up with versus the home life she establishes with Andre? How many kids does she end up having with Andre and how does she usually interact with him throughout their marriage? Very good. Um, I guess to start with the home life. Well, the home life starts off very tumultuous. Um, well, not tumultuous. It's just a. Um, it's like, it's like listening to a very unsettling atonal symphony. Like you know, like those atonal symphonies that are too subtle, and you ask yourself, why am I sitting in this theater in Vienna listening to this? You know, um, it's. I guess essentially, I think we should start back with what kind of caused the family feud really quick. So fun, uh, fun history fact time, which is not fun. Um, Irina used to have a thing for Danilo. And the problem was her family kind of wanted her to marry a dude with more money and land. And Danilo, his family was kind of going through a rough time. Was there had been a drought and they had to sell like a lot of stuff. And you know, the Novoshkinovs were not doing too good. Um, Lukian's family, the Tarasevs, you know, had quite a bit. And, you know, her family kind of prompted her to, you know, marry Lukian, and she didn't really want to, but she felt pressured to and maybe a bit scared uh, to, to do it, you know, because of like financial stability and stuff like that. But it's a decision that she'll always regret because Lukian is, is just the, I don't know, the, I don't know, he's, there's no words to describe Lucian, which I will get to. And I'm not trying to dehumanize him or make him into a one dimen dimensional villain, but there are some people out there that have no redemption, you know, and, and they exist. They choose no redemption. Um, but um, so that's kind of what caused that. And Danilo and Lucan, Lucian always have had a rivalry a bit. And that was kind of over arena. They got into a lot of fights and things like that, and led to a lot of physical violence that led to some very serious injuries and mishaps, and, you know, it's one of those things where, oh, she's let her call the cops, or whatever the equivalent of cops was back then, you know, um, but that's what, that, that's establishes it, so Irina is stuck with Lucian. Lucian's family is quite prosperous, but unfortunately, Lucian and his father are very se severe alcoholics. Um, they are, um, Lucian's not too much of an alcoholic. I think Lucian just has kind of a catonic psychopath problem, um, which I'll kind of get into later. I mean, it, it's, it's more complicated than just that label. I just had to put a label there for right now. Um, but they have pretty much um, gambled a lot of the fortune away, land to, a good deal of the horses and stuff like that. Um, the only thing that's really keeping kind of Lukian and the family alive is his officer status, because he is an officer, just like Andre's dad. He's just maybe just just a little bit higher on the ranks, just a little bit. But you know. But anyway, um, home life for Dasha 
is just essentially, I think the only thing she finds comfort in is really her mother. Her mother is very gentle. Um, her mother is very long suffering. Her mother is very neat. Um, Dasha really admires these, you know, really wonderful qualities of her mother. But at the same time, she's worried of being weak and controlled like her mother was and, and being, you know, powerless in a situation, you know. So home life for Dasha was not really happy when her father was around. It was pretty much like walking on glass and hoping it didn't break. Um, Lucian didn't talk much. He was very quiet, kind of deadpan most of the time. But then there would be suddenly sudden sharp episodes where he would he would do something violent and there was no fury or passion to it. That's what made it scary. It was very catonic. And um, I don't know, like maybe her mother asks something and I mean, he might just like, I don't know, punch her really hard in the face that I don't know, you know, her mouth starts bleeding or something, you know? And um, one might say, well, what, the, what prompts that? Well, Lucan is just, I don't know how to describe him really. Um, I think he's just a person who just likes to, he just likes to execute violence just for the sake of control, you know? And I think that's how he is as an officer because nobody likes him. I think if his men had the chance, they would so kill him and hide him behind a bush. Oh, where's your officer? Oh, I don't know, he, somewhere, you know? But Dasha's life was pretty much, um, walking on glass. It was a very cold, empty thing. And, and she just decided in order to protect herself, knowing that she would never get any love from her father. Um, she just kind of built a sort of a, a nuclear core chamber of ice around herself. And she didn't allow herself to get close to anybody or trust anybody, except maybe her mother. But it was kind of hard to rely on her mother because her mother was like, didn't have any power or any way to help her. It was just sort of like, I don't know. It's like you're stuck on a rowboat in the middle of the ocean and you're suffering together. I see. I see. Yeah. And then the contract. Oh, I'm sorry. Were, were you? Hmm? Oh, did, did you want me to like compare it to Andre now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. My, I went to like too far detail and I was like, oh, but anyway, contrast with Andre. Um, I think the family, so she is able to get a taste of good family life. Um, should I, am I allowed to throw out spoilers right now or should I save that for another podcast? Hmm. It's your choice. What do you think? I don't know if I should give spoilers about that thing Andre did or, or should we save that? Maybe we should save it. Okay, we'll save it. Well, anyway, um, she gets kind of a taste of it when she's with Andre's family this taste of happy home life. Like it's not perfect with Andre's family. They're a little crazy and just a slight dysfunctional, but at least they're happy, honest with each other. And there's, there's really no violence. They may bicker and holler and stuff, but they're clearly communicating. And then they try to work it out. Like, you know, his grandfather and aunt are always arguing, you know, <laughs> you know, and all that, but they work it out and there's never really any violence. No one's like, you know, violently punching each other or I don't know, like smashing a plate or something or doing some god awful thing. And, um, you know, um, she gets a taste of that happiness. So anyway, after the Civil War and she, she and Andre are reunited and they're gonna have a family and stuff. Um, they, build a, they, build, they build a very flexible home. You know, she does have her job and things like that. And she balances her, job and motherhood in a very um I wouldn't say modern way but what was necessary I mean you, you would read a lot about this how women had to progress in order to contribute to things and, and get things done and also provide stability for the family which wasn't available if you're just solely relying on the man for it you know and um you know Andre gives her her space he respects her profession and you know her ability and everything I think he's pretty impressed with it you know, that Dasha can adapt to this world so much better than he can. He's not really jealous of it at all. I mean, he's glad for it. And I think he tries to learn, learn from it from her, you know. Um, I think it, it's, it's it, everybody, how do I say, it's like, 
he can give her her own space, so to speak. Um, and she gives him his own space to try to figure things out. Um, there's a lot more clear communication. There's an interesting thing of foils. You know, Andre is very loud and, and brash and too outgoing. You know, he has too much energy. Like, I don't know, he just, he just drank too much Red Bull, you know, in the morning. Well, Dasha is quite the opposite. Um, she's very calm, focused, steadied. Um, she's sort of like a cat observing things, you know, just sitting on the fence, twitching her tail, observing it and waiting for her time. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an interest, it's a good balance and they understand that. She knows what she needs to provide and he knows what he needs to provide. Um, they want to make a very happy home for their children and they do. I mean, sometimes it's a little rough, you know, because of things like, you know, poverty and uncertainty and, you know, just, just stuff in general, just family life. But I think for the most part, they have had a good family life with their kids. Um, Andre's not playing favorites, but some of the kids he gets along better a bit, like their first daughter, Pelusia, he um, really gets along with her very well. And like most of the bro the two brothers want to accuse him of favoriting her um, because she's the most like him. I mean, she's like a female version of him, you know, except maybe prettier. Um, Matvi, his um, second child, his first son, um, they tend to clash a little bit as they get older because Matvi, he is, um, I don't know, he's, he's a bit of more of a, I'm not sure, I'll have to explore that more, but, but there is kind of a grinding of sand between them. And I think Mishatka, which is Mihail, um, the third child and the second son, um, he gets along quietly with his dad because Mishatka is the most like his mom, quiet, focused you know, kind of like a, a good, quiet friend that, that can listen to you. And um, so, you know, Andre has a different relationship with each kid. Um, I think Dasha, on the other hand, probably has the most conflict with her own daughter. She loves her, but, you know, it's like, it's really hard for her to try to teach her, okay, Felicia, let's try to be more ladylike. And I don't know, Felicia gets into a fight at school or something, you know. Um, but she does love her, and I guess she does love the fact that she's a lot like her daddy, you know. Um, I think Matvi, she really um, admires, you know, his focus and stuff like that. He's ironically more like Andre's brother, Kolya, out of the whole kids. It's kind of creepy, um, but she has a very good relationship with Matvi. In fact, I think Matvi was probably maybe out of all the kids hurt the most when she passed away because I mean he was the closest closest with his mom and then of course comes Mishaka because he and his mom are very much alike and he can like they don't even have to say too much like he'll be like oh, mom I understand and then she'll be like you know I know that you understand and I'm, I'm grateful that you understand because they process things the same way so that's how their relationships are um, with their kids, and I think they're working really hard to make a, a happy home life for them. I mean, it has its challenges, you know, like I said, and sometimes it's confusing because it's a changing society with changing morals and ethics and ideas and social conventions, so they're doing their best. They're navigating, and they run into some sticky holes in the road, potholes in the road, they have their challenges, but otherwise, I think they're doing pretty good. They're doing pretty good. But kids are all right, as they say. Great. That was a really great, you know, summary of the home life between Andre and the home life she experienced as a child with Lukian. Right, right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. I think we can cover more about, you know, the developments you've had with Dasha and the other characters next week. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much to cover and, you know, I think we can go into more detail next week about, you know, the spoilers, if you want to cover them or any other parts that you want to just like to talk about more, like any themes, like for example, how to tackle controversial topics like domestic violence in historical fiction. Right, exactly. That in itself demands a whole entire conversation and an entire podcast episode, maybe even two. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly so, yeah. so thank you so much for joining me again and it was a pleasure learning more about Dasha after creating her in The Sims 
Well, thank you so much. And thank you for creating her in The Sims. Without you, we wouldn't have a solid design on her. And thank you for this great interview. And I really enjoyed this. And thank you so much again for this. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.